Greetings. I'm Josh Tyson, co-author of the first best-selling book about conversational AI, Age of Invisible Machines. The book explores the learnings of conversational AI veteran and OneReach.ai CEO, Rob Wilson. Each week, Rob and I bring in a guest to continue the conversation we began in the pages of our book. This week on the Invisible Machines podcast, we're talking about how to incentivize the changes that will improve our relationship to productivity, the layers of centralization that we need to think about in the wake of generative AI, how we can challenge the norms associated with our personal data, and why we can't let Wikipedia falter. Our guest is Duran Asamoglu, Institute Professor of Economics at MIT and co-author of the books Power and Progress and Why Nations Fail. Duran's work has explored our thousand-year struggle with technology and prosperity, and he joins us for a timely conversation about the ways that AI might affect our relationship with economics. The staggering depth and density of hyper-automation will impact systems and individuals at every level of society, and we were thrilled to take this fruitful journey with Duran Asamoglu. All right. Well, Duran, thank you so much for joining us. We are very excited to have you here on the podcast today. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Rob. It's a true pleasure for me to be able to be with you. Yes, and Rob, it's a pleasure as always seeing you. Oh, uh, yeah. But one thing that we have talked a lot about on this podcast is how important it's going to be to sort of reconfigure our relationship to productivity in light of our increasing ability to automate. And in your book, Power and Progress, you and, and Simon Johnson talk about how progress kind of depends on the choices that we make about technology. So we thought it might be interesting to kind of start talking about, you know, some of the things we can do to incentivize these shifts to rebuild the narratives that have kind of come to define our economic systems, uh, you know, that we're living with today and, and how we might kind of change that trajectory moving forward. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about these things. You know, first of all, I think you know, every different age needs updated, upgraded institutions. It's It would be very unusual historically and curious if we didn't need to bolster our institutions right. in the age of AI. But beyond that, the other main idea that Simon and I try to advocate and propagate in the book is that there are always myriad choice when it comes to technology. It's not like there is a predetermined path of technology that we have to follow. So how we use that technology, how we use scientific advances, how we use new discoveries are going to matter quite a lot for productivity, for who gains and who loses, for democratic life or other aspects of social life. And when it comes to automation and when it comes to use of AI in the production process. I think one way to start the conversation is to do the following sort of thought experiment. Imagine you're a manager and you're given two boxes. You have to tick one of them. And one of them says, labor is a cost to be reduced. The other one says, labor is your most important resource. Which one would you tick? And I think for most of the 20th century, many managers would have ticked the first one, some would have ticked the second one. But at the end of the day, even if they ticked the first one, there weren't all that many things that they could have done in order to reduce labor's uh, expenses. Automation was always on the agenda, but wasn't enormous in terms of its capabilities. Today, we may be heading into a, uh, a phase of our economic system where there will be more opportunities. So it's going to be really important which type of manager you are, and then also for society to ask whether we want all managers to take the first box or, you know, actually it's very important for some of them to take the second yeah. one and use AI tools to make that key human resource more productive, more capable. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. I want to jump. I want to jump right into the Please. deep end. Go ahead. I want to go all the way to, to <laughs> depths here. Um, so the first thing, I want to combine two things you've talked about. One is centralization or decentralization. And I want to combine that with something else you talk about, which is hubris. Mm -hmm. And um, put those together and say, uh, I was talking to a pretty large company recently, right? Um, and and they were talking about adopting Copilot or Microsoft's you know, repackaging of ChatGPT 
in Office, which is sort of that bolt-on AI to Office. Um, and they were talking about, you know, deploying it to all their employees. This will be their AI strategy, which is, you know, what you could call a, a checkbox AI strategy, right? Like, you know, I can't think of a really good way to do it, so I'll just check this box and and that tells us we're doing it. Um, and my comment to them was, yeah, you know, go ahead, spend $30 a person times 10, 20,000 employees, but nothing's going to change. You're not going to remove a single employee. You're not going to see any productivity gains because they're already using it. They're already using it. You have this idea that you're they're not using it because you didn't allow them to. Um, and now you're going to allow them to, and then they're going to start using it, which is kind of to your point, the hubris of centralization, right? <laughs> they think they think they're in charge and they think they're in control, right? But at the end of the day, people are already using it and and they didn't notice is the other thing, right? They, did, they haven't it, it kind of kind of can't help but think they, they haven't noticed the difference yet. Um, and so is this, is this going to, like the fact that humans take so long to change habits, right? Um, the fact that we've invented the ability to do this stuff, uh, is it a foregone conclusion that we're all going to suddenly start adopting it? And is it going to be adopted in this centralized, controlled oh my God, the man is going to adopt technology? Or is it just the conservation of calories, right? And we as humans are going to adopt whatever reduces our physical load or cognitive load. And, and centralization is just this myth idea that somehow we could control what's going to happen with this technology. So thanks, Rob. I think there's so many ideas in what you just said. And I... I'm grateful that you brought centralization versus decentralization. I think that's actually a very, very key thing in my thinking. And at the end, we don't emphasize it sufficiently in power and progress. It's there, but I think with generative AI, it's become even more important. So, so I think we have to come back to that. That being said, I think the situation with Copilot is more complicated. Yes, sure. I think a lot of people are using ChatGPT, but they're not actually using it in a very productive way. It's not clear uh, that they are integrating into their work that much yet. And when it comes to co-pilot, you know, I'm doing some studies on this and, uh, you know, the results are not out yet, so I can't talk about those. But one thing we know, we see is a lot of people are not using co-pilot even when it's available and even when you try to incentivize that they're not using it. So we tend to exaggerate how quickly this technology is spreading in the production process. It was very, very quick at the gate when people started playing with ChatGPT. But I think its uh, spread in workplaces is going to be rapid, but it's not going to be breakneck paced. So, so there is an issue, and that actually doesn't uh, obviate the need to worry about the centralization, decentralization issue, because it's going to be critical how it is used and who controls the information. But it's now, the issue of centralization is a little bit more complex, right? You know, when, the, uh, uh, when we worry about centralization, you know, sometimes it's the government controlling right. the information. Or the early hackers were rightly worried about companies like IBM controlling information and, and doing it in a way that was non-democratic and not good for the computer revolution. But with large language models, you know, there are many different layers of centralization. It could be that it's the management of a large or medium-sized company that decides what is going to be used and how it's going to be used, and that's one sort of centralization. But another sort of centralization is that it's OpenAI and Microsoft that set the parameters of how you use it and what answers you're going to get from these technologies. Right. So there are these two different types of centralization and I think we have to think about which one we want, or can we have a third one, which is much more decentralized? 
Right. And it's going to be much more decentralized. In what way it's going to be decentralized? How are we going to incentivize that decentralization in terms of right. the tools and the use of it? And if it's going to be centralized, how do we put guardrail? Right. I mean, when it comes to centralization, how much of it do you think is actual centralization of power and how much, and I know this this kind of is a crossover here, but is the illusion of centralization? I think both are there. Both are there. So absolutely, I think there may be an illusion of centralization that I control the large language model and therefore I control your information and the human mind is very versatile and you cannot social en socially engineer things that easily. But on the other hand, you know, all of these large language models, just by nature of the way that they were originally built uh, or trained in the unsupervised training stage, they have a huge amount of garbage in them. And they have yes. crazy, extremist, yeah. hateful ideas. So that the path in which they developed, and that, that, I don't think this was the only path, by the way. So there were some key architectural choices that people such as OpenAI leaders made. But once we went down that path, then they have to be trained, retrained in the supervised learning stage where you have to teach them to say certain things and not to say certain things. Right, that's the that is a type of censorship mm -hmm. yep. that you know we haven't seen in the Western world. Like, right. imagine that I give that power to a totalitarian regime that no. you have yeah. a repository of information, and you decide through reinforcement learning what are the things that you can right. say. You can say X it is good like and Y is very bad. fast. Right. So, so that's something, you know, we are we have stumbled into. Uh -huh. We are not talking about it, and we don't have institutions for guarding against that right at the same time we also though have alternative language models uh, you have you know elon musk sort of yeah going down the the less aligned version right <clears throat> um i i do agree with you there's when you think mathematically mm -hmm. about a large language model it it begins in this sort of decentralized sort of way because it's just collecting information there is a certain amount of centralization in that the choices of where to get the data and where to source the data is certainly there. What ingredients you put in, you know, you know what you'll get out to some degree. Right. For but, example, it was a choice to have large language models trained on Reddit. Right. Exactly. We could have yep. decided not, you were never going to use Reddit data. And, and right. I'm not saying Reddit is uniquely bad. Uh, but Reddit does have a lot of extremism, lots of conspiracy theory, lots of crazy stuff in there as well as some good stuff. But that might have had very different effects on what sorts of things yes. creep into these models. Yeah, yeah. and if that becomes a, a marketplace where Reddit sells its data, which it seems like that's where it's going, yeah. then they may create versions of their data. Now they're incentivized to create versions that might censor that stuff out. Um, and now... Not and so. now we have censorship just sort of moving from the open AI place to the marketplace. Right. Yeah, which... I mean, I think, I think this is just like touching on another thing, which is I think whatever architecture we adopt, data is going to be crucial for our economy and for AI models. Right. And so I don't think you would say, I don't think it would be easy to say that data is much less important for the future economy than land. But it's right. crazy that we could have like an economy in which you grab any land you want and nobody improves the land and the land quality goes to pieces over time. But that's the world we are in vis-a-vis -vis data. And it's not just a distributional issue. There's a distributional issue in there. Do you get compensated for the creative data that you have generated? But it's also a quality issue. If we don't create an ecosystem in which high quality data is demanded and rewarded, we're not going to create the high quality data. Right, right. Yeah, if well, there's not like a marketplace for good data. Uh, it seems like we need to, in terms of narratives, change the way people think about their own personal data perhaps too, because that's right. I think with products like Facebook and Instagram, people tend to think of them as free, but they're really paying a pretty steep price to use them. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I think it's also kind of created this, or partially probably informed the trajectory that we're on where people don't view technology the way that they might want to in order to perhaps leverage their own data 
in more beneficial ways. Absolutely. So they're not just being preyed upon. I think there is people's personal data, which is really important if you're going to go down the digital ad business. It's also important for training the models. Then there is the data of high quality providers, just the OpenAI, Microsoft versus New York Times case, or the you know Hollywood uh, strike. We're all about high quality data. How do we reward it? How do we create the ecosystem? But the general thing is, I think we have already arrived to a point now where certain norms developed about data that will shape how we can move forward. Most people don't believe anymore that they can have their data as private. Either explicitly they would say that there's no way to protect their data, or implicitly they've come to accept the world in which there's just not going to be that sort of protection. So recreating a different set of legislation, institutions, regulations, so that you know, there is some amount of control over your data. It's going to be hard when you start from this situation. Yeah, it seems like, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to overcome the conservation of calories as a primary drive driver for human beings saying, I'll give up my data if it means I burn less calories, either thinking or doing. Um, and, and I, yeah, I think one of the biggest questions that just keeps ringing in my mind is this illusion of control that if if we if it's sort of like um people in in your position but around global warming that could see it coming long ahead and said, "Hey everybody, like plenty of time now, we can we can get in front of this." And then nobody doing anything about that, right? Um because we just react to problems as they arise. Um, and I sort of I sort of feel like we're in a funny moment now where we've talked a lot about the implications of generative AI and technology and machines getting smarter. And the fact that, you know, what if what if machines get so smart that they can replace a lot of our, you know, of the, of our uh, sort of daily lives <clears throat> and and our behaviors uh, throughout our day that relate to making money. And um, I don't know, I just sort of wonder if if it's futile to think about control and more just understand people adopted this already, not, it wasn't governments or corporations that you know that adopted it in their organizations. They're well, behind. It is, it is. It is a. It is an interaction. Let me give you an example. So, I think the European Union had the right idea and priorities when they passed the General Data Protection Regulation (GDPR). So they worried about the default being, you know, companies collect your data without you even understanding. But then, in the usual sausage making process of legislation, they ended up with something that's not that much better. Why? Because what happens is right now, if you go to a European website or if you're in the, in Europe and you're ac- accessing a American website, they have to ask for your permission. Yeah. But the way that they do that, most websites do that, is that they give you, do you accept it? Click. And if not, you cannot access this website or you have to jump through several hoops. So therefore, the legislation and the regulation made the default still the empowerment of the, of the platform. But now imagine, and that, that exactly leads to the, to the situation that you sort of uh, described. You know, Most people, including me, even though I'm very conscious about this problem, I just don't have the time to go through those menus, and if I want to access that information, I'm just going to click OK. So that will appear exactly like you say. We're conserving uh, brain power and physical power to get to what we want in the quickest possible way. But imagine that European Commission had taken the next step and they actually made it such that the default was that the data was mine. And I would have to, I, I would always have that default of not having my data collected and that I would have to agree to the alternative. 
that would have led to a very different ecosystem. And overall, uh, I think over time, norms would have evolved such that it would have been le much less acceptable both for American and European companies to actually collect your data. Yeah. So I think we, yeah, are we, have a, we, have a... we are not as powerless as you may have implied, Rob, but that power needs to originate from both institutions and norms. So we need to have the right regulations, light, right, light legislation, and then that will influence how people behave yeah. and what norms they internalize. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I, I definitely agree that it's, it's not a situation where we don't do anything. We, do, we don't just put our hands up and say, oh, there's nothing we could do. <laughs> let's just, let's just, you know, let the dogs out and see what happens. Um, yeah, that's the difference I would say between optimism and hopefulness. We don't need to be optimistic that things are going to sort out by themselves, but we have to be hopeful that we have some solutions to at least the most egregious problems. Right, right. Um, the 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 fu the funny irony for me is that you know we're all gonna we're all gonna sit around pontificating on w what's gonna happen and. There's so many possible outcomes, you know. Um, Absolutely, and, I, I, think, I think that's actually that's a great way to put it, Rob. Because I, I think it's really important to talk about these issues right now because there are so many outcomes. Not because we have any certainty, nor do we even have any sort of uh, confidence that we know what the major problems will be. But unless we engage in the thought experiments of what the problems are and what are alternative pathways that could be better, I think we would be, quote, really yeah. unawares in the midst of this very transformative change. Yeah. I I just can't help but think of the irony of this situation as in, I know we're not there yet with AI, but is there a day where AI could do a better job of predicting the outcome of AI uh -huh. than we are right now? And, and... And the well, things I think, we I think could that do to create be, that, that will better be, that outcome. That would not be that far off because that's a much more algorithmic problem. I think uh, we're not going to see situations in which AI can engage in truly creative tasks that require judgment and multiple types of intelligences being combined for quite a while. But that sort of predictive tasks, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, so it's ir ironic that that the technology we talk about and the outcome could be it using it to determine the outcome and to determine the best course of well, action absolutely. to and avoid we're, yeah, we're doing negative that already. outcomes. Like, you know, we're building AI models against deep fake generated by AI. Right, right. We are, there are companies building AI models to detect essays written by ChatGPT. Yeah. So, so, it's a, so that's not necessarily a great thing. I mean, it's, given where the situation we are, we probably need these technologies, but it's a clear, wasteful arms race. Yeah. We're, we're, I mean, it's just like the spam issue. So we had a, a situation 30 years ago or 25 years ago where hundreds of millions of dollars were going into uh, illicit companies uh, developing spam, and then we had to invest even more money in order to develop ways of preventing that spam. Right. So now it's worse than spam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the things that we uh, we talk about on this podcast and in our book is is the power that this technology can unleash when it's put into the hands of people who really understand the tasks that that uh, can be automated. Um, and I think that yeah. actually kind of creates a healthier relationship with this technology because I guess we were talking before about pontificating or maybe even just I think there's kind of a there's so much happening right now as such a grand scale that it almost you know, feels like there's nothing you can do. You just feel shocked by it. But I think yeah. as people start interacting with it and seeing how it can actually benefit them on a daily Absolutely. basis, what and they can take part in like kind of co-piloting with the technology, right. then it Absolutely. not Absolutely. only like improves their daily lives, but I think that might yeah. also, yeah. to what you were talk you talk about a lot, Duran, uh kind of change the narrative, right? Where Absolutely. people Absolutely. actually Water have an, an informed I mean, I think opinion some, about sometimes it. Sometimes people read some of my writing uh, academic writing and power and progress as saying, you know, Daron is critical of automation. I'm not critical of automation. I think automation is very important. It's been important yeah. and it will continue to be important. What I think is that we should always 
combine automation with other things that a increase human agency uh-huh. gives some control yes. over humans yes. and b generates new more skilled tasks for humans yeah and good automation is exactly the the way that you've put it Josh is you know people understand what can be automated and also change the work organization around it so that workers skills judgment and talents are still employed let me give you another example which i i i think is is extreme but to me it's very important you know when calculators were first introduced we didn't say okay we now have calculators we should stop teaching arithmetic and algebra and we should have humans never engage in any kind of algebra or multiplication or division we thought of calculators as a tool that we could use to help us but at the same time we continued to teach humans in high school and middle school basic mathematics and also more advanced mathematics that could not be completed by a calculator but could be helpful sometimes because you have access to the services of a calculator and i think that's the way that we should use large language models and generative ai as well we should not abandon our understanding of things that generative ai can do because human knowledge is cumulative if you abandon arithmetic you cannot do more complex math you cannot understand more complex math and we should continuously strive to expand what it is that we can do because generative ai works very differently than the human mind and once you accept that then there are lots of complementarities that we could exploit but when you do it in an uncontrolled way you risk the bad scenario like when with chatgpt in the hands of lots of students in middle school how are they using it i have no idea the teachers have no idea <laughs> yeah. going back to our <laughs> centralization decentralization debate doro yeah are we do you think we're, we're we're i struggle over this one but do you think there's a possibility we're we're reaching sort of a pinnacle of productivity here that's different from the past in the sense that if you worked in a coal mine putting a machine in a coal mine um it, it kind of defines happiness as the abs- it's sort of that happiness when you're banging your head against a wall is when you stop right and so working in a coal mine um you know the 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 health effects the the labor the discomfort happiness is just literally the absence of all of that discomfort um but it doesn't it doesn't go to the other side the sort of enlightenment side the like happiness after the absence of suffering now what is happiness right and you mentioned it that it's one of the components of happiness might be agency like just we we like making decisions you yeah. we like that's what we want to do and i think there's lots of evidence to show that people are happier when they're able to make their own decisions even if the tasks they're doing are laborious in nature once you add agency to that task they seem to be happier and and so the idea is that we're we're now reaching this pinnacle and the question is do we now have to always face these existential questions of what is it that economics and work and productivity and machines to what end to what end do these serve like before we could just say oh the absence of disease or the absence of working in a dark place now do we have to understand why all of these things ultimately exist in a society and is it just agency is part of an experience that we all want to have yeah. and so machines need to give us these choices so that we can be happy not not to make them for us absolutely absolutely look i mean i think there's a lot more for us to understand both from a social psychological point of view and from a philosophical point of view but there seems to be no doubt that humans find purpose in having agency and feeling that they are contributing something that they have some some place in society and so if you take all of that away from people i think it's always dangerous you know the idea of alienation wasn't suggested by marx it was all the rage decades before marx because when people's existing economic social relations were already appended by industrialization and moves from the countryside to the cities there was a deep sense of okay what am i doing here and that's what philosophers were reacting to and today we are probably at the beginning of another 
period like that. So it's very important that we ask what we want from the machines. Yeah, and in terms of productivity, I mean, like we we have the ability now, I guess maybe this is more machine automation, but to just produce more and more things. And it, and that could go on unchecked, I suppose. But you have to, it's, at some point, we need to call into question, like, what is our ultimate goal? Is it just to populate the world with water bottles and yeah. tennis <laughs> shoes and just more and more stuff that people have been conditioned to think that they need? Or is part of this bigger shift, like thinking more uh, deeply about what we want to produce, whether that's material things or, exactly. I guess, experiences. 100%, 100%. And and also we tend to exaggerate, I think, the ease with which we can do some of these things. And there are many barriers which then create the risk of a double whammy where you lose the human agency, but you actually don't get the benefits. You know, some of it is like, some of the benefits are not mega, you know. Okay, we can uh, automate all self-checkout, all all sort of uh, uh, personal transactions with self-checkout kiosks, but that's not going to revolutionize the economy. That was not like a huge part of GDP. You're not going to get a big productivity boom because you have no uh, nobody checking you out at supermarkets or, or at Walgreens. So, so, the, so we tend to exaggerate a little bit what we're going to get. And then we also underestimate the difficulty of it. We started in this country, I think, all, uh, you know, with electronic health records and sharing of health records between different health providers 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's still not working. Yeah. It's still not working. And it's the human problem. It's not a technological problem. I still get asked to do the same blood tests in multiple places because they can't share the information. So, you know, it's... Uh, uh, you know, on top of that, you put chat GPT, it's not going to revolutionize anything. So we need to sort of think about what is the best way of we can improve the organizational production together with, you know, uh, making sure that the, it serves human objectives and human purposes. Yeah. I <clears throat> was, you know, I, I know that, that there's a lot of inequity, so I don't want to I don't want to suggest for a second that we've solved that problem, but I also, as a as a person that you know sees things mathematically, can say that some of that inequity exists around one person having a fifteen hundred square foot house, and then another person having a thirty thousand square foot house, and saying and lots of people in San Francisco not having houses at all, and yeah, not having houses yeah. at all. I, I see the inequity between the not having a house and the 1500 square foot house as being something we need to focus on. I, I don't understand fully the focus on the inequity of the 1500 square foot house and the 30,000 square foot house. Well, look, in I the mean, sense I, I, who I've needs had, a 30,000 square foot house? I've argued the same thing for quite a while, but with less conviction than perhaps you may want to go on the record, so let's have uh -huh. this conversation. So I've been arguing for quite a while that what we should care about much more is what's going on at the bottom of the income distribution, right. not to what's going on with the top 1% or 0.1%, but with one, one, what, two caveats. What is it if the top, say, 0.1% really explodes? That's that it. raises a risk of political capture, so we have to watch out for that. And True. set and what's going centralization on centralization again, right? Centralization again, but and the second, what's going on at the very top might then have trickle down norm effects, meaning that if you see like five people control all the wealth, then that might actually send signals down the entire society for you know less uh, attention to community cooperation uh. and so on and so forth. And that, those are the things that we have to watch out for. But other than that, yeah, I don't, I'm not going to feel much better if we take a uh, billion dollar from Bill Gates and give, give it to a couple of millionaires instead. Right. So that redistribution between the 0.01% and the top 1% is not going to make me any happier, except for these two channels that I would still worry about. Well, it seems like OpenAI has sort of, I guess, opened the doors in a way for another you know, like Apple or Google, like a, a something coming out of a garage and changing the world, like for that to happen yeah. again, because 
like with Stanford making a large language model for 600 bucks yeah. and and pretty much anyone who you can ask ChatGPT how to create your own LLM on yes. a, you know on your own server system uh it seems like there's also a possibility that some disruption might come from very unexpected and uh small places like from maybe the middle class or even lower which could yeah. have interesting ripple absolutely. effects absolutely yeah. those are possibilities and that's one of the things that i meant uh there are so many scenarios that we have to consider and we don't have any confidence. And let me just walk through the issues that you've just raised. So we may be at the verge of a true productivity revolution because the open source and other small scale, large language model, generative model, AI models might democratize innovation. That's a possibility. Right. Right. Or we may be in a situation in which network economies are so important that a pretty good LLM can never compete against Claude and uh, chat GPT. So that's a possibility. The same that in the search engine space has been very difficult to dislocate Google search because they have all the data and they have improved it because they have had all the resources. The second dimension uh, that makes it complicated is, again, this is a little bit like the issue of centralization and decentralization. We actually don't know whether it's better or worse for regulation when you have open source models. So it may well be that the open source models are actually a part of a self-regulating system because they create competition, or it may well be that they're just going to be much harder to regulate because anybody can use them to create bioweapons or or for malicious uh, purposes. So, so I think there are these two dimensions, how effective these are going to be, and if they are effective, is there going to be a good thing or a bad thing because they can actually break all regulatory barriers as well. So those are the scenarios we have to walk through yeah. and then be prepared in terms of institutions and legislation to yeah. grapple with them. Yeah, I think something interesting in what you're saying there is, uh, the way I would put it is, we, we invented the wheel, um, we discovered the, wheel, the, the circle, right? Um, and, 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 and someone was going to discover the circle and we were going to create a wheel and now the wheel's out there and lots of people are going to use the wheel to create all kinds of things mm -hmm. um and nobody's going to be able to control the fact that that's already been discovered but as the, our resources get poured into those centralized sources so we start giving a an ordinate amount of capital towards OpenAI and Microsoft and Google, mm -hmm. that it's not, it's not the discovery or or their control of the innovation that actually centralizes them. It's the fact that we're pouring our economic Absolutely. resources and the venture into capital. Them. Look, you know, imagine two different worlds. One world has a large language models and, and Silicon Valley and all the same network economies, but doesn't have venture capital. There's a and then the other one, like the one we live in, which has venture capital. I think the latter is centralizing resources to a much greater degree. Yeah. Venture yeah, capital I think just pours money, especially during the times when interest rates were near zero. It pours an incredible amount of money in whichever technology that it thinks is most promising, but often it's implicitly building a banking on data monopolization. Right. They're also hoping that once you become big enough, you're going to monopolize all the relevant data in this field. So that's not the right type of competition. Right, right. Yeah. And it, and that's just sort of self-fulfilling. It like everybody invests in the big companies. And I think one of the concerns I have economically is we see a, a hopefully temporary but might not be a, a huge disruption in that VC world. Um and and so now you have this idea that the smaller companies don't have the capital um and and then massive amounts of capital pouring into these larger companies. Um, perfect example earlier in this conversation, you know, uh, a, a large company paying $30 per person for something their employees already have, right? Um, going, oh my gosh, there's going to be a consolidation of capital in the tech world. And that's the fear. It's not the consolidation of the technology because that's out. It's the fact that that the VC world is disrupted. They're not funding nearly the way they used to at this moment. And and when somebody wants to invest in the future, 
they think the easy button is, you know, invest in Microsoft, invest in OpenAI, and whether that easy button is just by their prescriptive, you know, out of the box AI strategy. Um, and s so you can check the box, you know, to your shareholders to say we have an AI strategy or whether that's, you know, investing in those stocks. Now we have a consolidation of power that's more around finance than it is about technology. Um, and then we're sort of squeezing it's sort of, I guess it's what you, what we talked about in a different world. It's the, the you know, the, 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 the open source is one end of the spectrum. The big tech companies is the other end. And that middle class company that the ones that, you know, have some funding and, and want to disrupt are getting squeezed in this moment. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And they're, they're being squeezed in many ways. They're not getting capital. They're competing against, you know, gigantic corporations. And third, you know, that something that doesn't get enough attention, you know, big tech companies are gobbling them up very right. rapidly when they feel those could be competitors to them. So at the end, that's not horrible for middle-sized companies because some of their owners or founders make money. But... At the end, they don't turn into competitors. Right. Like Instagram and WhatsApp could have been competitors to Facebook. They're not. And it's not just Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Amazon. They're all doing that. And it seems we have mechanisms for this, right? We have, I mean, maybe they don't work. Maybe they do right. work. But this is, we haven't been right. using it. Yeah. Is there, I mean, it's, I hate to make it, make the answer something as boring as antitrust, but is that, is that where to start? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I would I would start there. I mean, I've I've also uh, written an op-ed a number of years ago saying antitrust isn't enough. You know, if, uh, if what you care about is innovation, especially the direction of innovation, antitrust is not the right tool for that. Okay. But antitrust is a complementary tool, especially if you don't want some companies to get gigantic, and and, and eat up all of their competitors. Antitrust is a very relevant tool. And we could have a conversation about whether Facebook should be broken up into Instagram and WhatsApp, and that's a very contentious issue. I think there are pros and cons. But in the meantime, let's stop these corporations buying up rivals. Let's not give them permission to get even bigger. That seems like yeah, a no like, the, like the, in the open source realm, Wikipedia seems like a good example of how something can improve when it's community regulated because I mean I can remember in the early days of Wikipedia it was kind of a dubious source of information it could be a, a good starting point and and I think to a degree if you're serious about uh, like journalism or whatever you would you would use that as a starting point but the community does a really good job of maintaining the quality of that Wikipedia information. Wikipedia is one of and, the biggest successes of the internet economy in my opinion. Yeah. And what makes it yeah. so interesting going back to this centralization or decentralization Jimmy Whale initially did not envisage Wikipedia. He His model for Wikipedia was an internet encyclopedia written up by experts. That's what he was trying to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was only when that model hit a wall that they started experimenting and they came up with something that they didn't themselves think about. And it just sort of took off. And it's and it That's really super interesting. is interesting. I did not know that amazing sort of success, precisely what the way Josh described it. You know, when we're having such horrible time regulating misinformation on social media and Facebook and Twitter saying, we can't content moderate and this stuff is just too hard, Wikipedia found a way of doing it in a very, very reliable way. You know, you don't find much uh, misinformation, certainly no disinformation in Wikipedia that stays there for a length of time. But Wikipedia now is at the risk of disappearing because OpenAI has used all of the Wikipedia information in its in the training of its models. So now a lot of Wikipedia information is already in in chat GPT. So at some point, you know, people may stop going to Wikipedia and giving 
you know, contributing to Wikipedia yeah. because they think it's there already. It's funny. I thought a lot about this. I, 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 I couldn't, I, I couldn't decide. My prediction skills weren't good enough to figure this out, but um, we can get an algorithm. We, to help we know that. that if you go put something into Wikipedia, it eventually gets into OpenAI. So, does it become an intermediary? In other words, we go put it into Wikipedia so we can get it into OpenAI. It's sort of like search engine, right? Google. It's it's an intermediary. It's not a destination, and therefore we may continue to populate Wikipedia. We may, just, we may, just so we can populate indirectly all the LLMs out we there. We may, we may, but here are two concerns, and and we have some evidence on this. First of all, people, you know, Wikipedia secret sources the people who contribute to it. True, and yeah. those people are doing it because they have a mission. They think they're part of a community. So if you destroy that community. That yeah, their purpose. Data. Second, Wikipedia is working because people go and use it. So if yeah. they stop being used, it's not going to work as well. And we know this from another repository that's been raided by OpenAI, uh, uh, Stack Overflow. Okay. So Stack Overflow is where GPT-4 learned how to program. And there's a recent, relatively recent paper that came out from a number of researchers that shows very nicely that the moment ChatGPT4 is released in the countries where it could be used, stack overflow traffic in computer programming plummets. People are not using stack overflow. They're not going there anymore because they're just asking GPT4. But in Russia and China where ChatGPT is banned, they're still continuing to do so. Stack, stack overflow for math is still being used. And but that, what that implies is that if you have your next large language model and you want to train it, you can no longer do it in Stack Overflow. The amount of traffic has declined a lot. You just hit me with an interesting thought there. Um, it, the internet is filled with conversations between people. Is it? And the more we start having conversations between a person and a machine, yes. if that's not visible on the internet, like it isn't on Chat GPT, and we do less talking between ourselves, we're creating less data Absolutely. for these things. Especially for high quality stuff. Right. Especially right. You know, what what's very special about Wikipedia and Stack Overflow is that they're repositories of high quality information. And they're very well curated, they're very well organized, so that other humans could use it very well. Right. But that also makes it very easy for OpenAI to use. Right, right. Well, so what we're, Rob was saying too, like if you layer on training data that's coming from generative models instead of human to human interactions, that kind of further Absolutely. That that, that was that was the root of my earlier comment about, you know, we really need to create an ecosystem for high quality data to be generated because the market's not gonna do that by itself. Yeah. We talk a well, lot about you... this in AI in terms of of what its objective should be, whether it's economics, AI, machines. Let's just talk about machines. Because I think it's it's more accurate than AI. Um, smart machines would be um, would be better serving society if they connected us better to each other. In other words, connection, as you're pointing out, is the conversations between people on Stack Overflow, not the conversation between a person and a machine. Um, and and if we foster, if we used it to foster more conversation and enrich those conversations, then we end up in a better place if we use Absolutely. it but, but it, even, to even, replace even it. That, that, that requirement, your second, your last sentence, I think, is the important one. I would say a reasonable metric should be high quality connections, not just the number of connections. So right, when right. Facebook rushed to create 3 billion, 2, two plus, two, 2 billion plus users, those were high quality conversations. That, that was very, very much conducive to misinformation and extremism and crazy stuff circulating because they did it in a way that fostered low quality connections. So I don't want to be the judge of what is a high quality connection versus not, but a... but, but I think we need to have some metric that cares about that. Yeah. Do you think something like uh, UBI could factor into sort of a, perhaps a revitalized, healthy kind of a capitalistic democracy? And, and also it seems like if there were to be a UBI, it feels like 
these giant uh, tech companies should be the ones perhaps paying a lot of it because because of precisely, precisely what we're talking about. Like these large language models are built off of everyone's interactions with the internet. You could, yeah. I mean, people well, you could know, argue, not, I mean, the I'm New York Times case is interesting. I'm not a okay. fan of UBI and let me explain it to you and then yeah. uh, riff off what you just suggested at the end for something better uh, than UBI if you want to go that, in that direction. You know, the reason why I'm not a fan of UBI is, is threefold. One is I find it defeatist. It accepts a future in which human agency is not important. Most humans are dispensable. So it says, you know, we are accepting that 90%, 80% of the population is not going to be productive. The only way we can give them a decent life is by giving them handout. And I think that's very sad. Oh, and I don't yeah. think it's, it's, it's something we should settle for because there are ways in which to use tech we can use technology to make these people more productive, more, uh, more well-informed, you know, heck, uh, we need thousands, ten, tens of thousands more electricians in this country. Yeah. Uh, there's a shortage of electricians at the moment. It's going to get much worse. Why not use generative AI to train more people as electricians and give better right. tools to people yeah. to uh, troubleshoot problems? But there's so many things we can do rather than just settle for UBI. Yeah, Second, I think you said it, is that people want to have agency and they want to contribute. So the second problem is related to that. So imagine we created a UBI and Elon Musk and uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates earn a lot of money and then they give 10%, 15%, 20% of their wealth or income so we can have a UBI. That's going to be a very hierarchical society. There are going to be these very high status makers and then the rest are going to be viewed as takers. We live off the crumbs of these people. So that's not going to be a very good society either. And third... Look, I mean, billionaires have got out of their ways to create these tax havens to avoid taxation. Do you think they're going to immediately say, okay, fine, I'm going to give half of my income so that, you know, we can create a UBI? So so I think uh, if you think about it that way, first, let's try to make technology more useful to people, but also find more just ways of distributing the the spoils. So if we say... That, you know, Rob and Josh, you know, we, you know, OpenAI should make a payment to you because they're learning from your, uh, from your podcast. That recognizes your contribution. That recognizes your agency. That encourages you to create even better podcasts in the future as, as opposed to, you know, OpenAI has made a lot of money, so it's going to give you UBI. So I think if we find ways in which we monetize the data economy in the right way, it would be better. Right. Also, seems like these oversized tech companies are, are are detrimental to capitalism in a way, right? Because, like what you were talking about, they they are stamping out competition. Absolutely. So there, yeah, there has to be some sort of mechanism. I don't know if it's like wealth redistribution or what, but to like make up some of the inequality that has right. run. I think, so I think it's, it's 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 a major problem. So it will require a multi pronged approach. Uh, it will require some antitrust tool so that we have a more competitive market. It will require tools so that we uh, strive for better innovation, innovation that has a better direction in terms of how we make people more productive, how we make people more capable and better informed, more decentralization that's actually conducive to better democracy and better workplace participation. And we also need to have a better social safety net. So all of these are going to be necessary, absolutely. Are, are there examples of that Working out in the real world, I mean, I heard you talking a bit about how in Scandinavian countries they have stronger unions, and that has kind of created a different relationship between technology and productivity. Absolutely, and, it has. And, and but, you know, they've so. never had had to deal with the current situation. Uh, yeah. But you know, a couple of things that are misapprehensions about Scandinavia. So that's useful to talk about. First of all, uh, sometimes people think, oh, you know, Scandinavia is so homogeneous; they've always been equal. You know, that's not true. Sweden was one of the most unequal countries in the world. Norway, Denmark were very, very unequal at the beginning of the 20th century. So they had their own Elon Musk's and Mark Zuckerberg's, big billionaires, and the social welfare state was built uh, despite that. So it's possible. Second, you know, people, sometimes people think, you know, Sweden is so equal because they redistribute a lot. Well, there's some truth to that. They have a very good social safety net and some parts of it really encourage people to participate in the workplace, for example, you know, childcare and education, et cetera. But actually the big difference between Sweden and the United States is not in the amount of redistribution, it's in the pre-redistribution income. 
So because of unions, because how technology is used, perhaps market competition, I'm not sure, perhaps education system, I'm not sure, Sweden pre-tax income distribution is much more equal than the U.S. We had a conversation, I don't know if it was on this podcast, someone was saying that uh, they were reading that a lot of the best dance music, I think, comes out of those countries, and, and one hypothesis was because of that social safety net, because people were more they were less afraid to take yeah. creative risks or to explore their passions because they didn't feel like their world would collapse if yeah. they, there is, you know, there is some, I, mean, a, both, a both sides. I mean, you know, Silicon Valley, I'm very critical of some aspects of it. On the other hand, you cannot be, we cannot but marvel at the amount of entrepreneurship and risk taking in Silicon Valley. So perhaps that's going to be harder to recreate in a, in a system like Scandinavia. On the other hand, there are other aspects in which people, because they have access to the social safety net can take more risks. You know, the, I don't know whether this is, I should, I should have checked this, but uh, 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 this, the, I think J.K. Rowling was on the doll when she started writing Harry Potter. So if she did not have access to unemployment benefit and she had to go and work at McDonald's, yep. she would not have been able to find the yeah. time to write Harry Potter and look how much impoverished we would be. Yeah. I think I, I, the interesting thing about all this is freeing people up to feel safer, to take more risk, I go back to something you talked about earlier, which is hubris. There's two sides to risk taking. There's risks that turn out working out, and then there's risks that yeah. turn out not working out. And I think that's sort of at the crux of this conversation, AI, and all conversations around smarter machines is yeah. that, yes, more risk taking means more risk taking. It means more downsides as well as upsides. And I guess the bigger the big question and as we're winding down here is how much risk taking what is the right amount of risk taking that should be happening right now? <laughs> and what is this type too of much or too taking? little? And what type of risk taking? You know, mm -hmm. there's no doubt that Elon Musk took a risk when he bought Twitter and tried to reorganize it. But is that the right kind of risk taking? Right. And you know, hubris I think is very, very important. As you can, as you can see, my belief from the book. But the other side of that is empathy. Hey. So perhaps in the age of even smarter machines, we have to worry about what are the things that build empathy and what are the things that make us lose empathy. Uh, and and I think hubris is uh, is an enemy of empathy. I think when people become too hubristic, they lose their ability to empathize. I think. Uh, the work by the social psychologist Dalhar uh, Dalhar Keltner is uh, is super interesting. So what he finds is that when people become more empowered in lab, or when they are richer, they justify their success and they become less empathic. So part of the institution's role may be to make sure that we don't lose our empathy, uh, even when there are billionaires. And I think that also ties back to your comment about the danger of centralization of wealth. Um, two bad combinations is centralization of power and loss of empathy. The, yes, absolutely. These, this is a bad combination. Absolutely. This, That's is, this is a great conversation. I, uh, we could go on and on, um, but I know that we can't, unfortunately. We'll have to get you back <laughs> on because I think there'll be a lot more to talk about uh, coming I'll be, up here. I'll be very happy to come back on. This was a great conversation, Josh and Rob. And uh, these issues are not going to go away. I think, you know, two years from now, we will be debating some of the same questions and then there will be many new ones. And, yes. Uh, and maybe we'll have an stuff. AI to debate with us so everybody can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks again, Duran. Appreciate yes. it. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, thanks again for joining this ongoing conversation about conversational AI. Be sure to subscribe to Invisible Machines wherever you get your podcasts. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a review on the Apple Podcast app. You can also watch these conversations on the Invisible Machines YouTube channel. This podcast is produced for UX Magazine in partnership with OneReach.ai. Over the past five years, our team of nearly 200 engineers, scientists, experienced designers, anthropologists, and linguists have been developing Generative Studio X an award-winning platform that has the lone distinction of being named a leader by every major analyst group. 
GSX is a complete environment for hosting, creating, analyzing, and scaling your own digital teammates called Intelligent Digital Workers. For an interactive demo of IDWs in action and to learn more about the GSX platform, head to onereach.ai. This podcast would not be possible without the hard work and dedication of executive producer Elias Parker and producer Kate Timchenko. Our video and audio editor is Michael Litvinov, and we rely on support from the marketing team at OneReach.ai, including Allison Harshberger, Anastasia Nechtalio, and Vera Pekodko. Thanks again, and we look forward to connecting with you next week, right here on Invisible Machines. <laughs>